The time has come for the Cobra to rise up and reveal himself. Welcome back, my quiver of capitalists, to AP Economics, presented by Cobranomics. Your all-American, American history teacher, gold standard of economics, le champion of classical liberalism, and sensei of supply side, Professor G here, and today we are going to continue our march through the banking system and take a look at Unit 5, Lesson 3, where we have, we're going to take a look into fractional banking and how fractional banking creates the money multiplier, which is ultimately going to be the creation of new money and the engine of investment spending. So first, let's take a look at our bank balance sheet, and this is the money that comes into into banks and how the banks divide that money. So, our friend here, he's smiling, he's happy, he got paid. He goes to the bank and he puts his money in a demand, say he has a thousand dollars, and he puts his money into a demand deposit, which is your essential M1 or even M2 bank account. So, that thousand dollars. Now, what does the bank do with that thousand dollars? This thousand dollars first for a bank is called an all demand deposits, especially checking accounts, are liabilities for the bank because at any time we can go to the ATM and withdraw that money. So a liability means that it is a risk for the bank. And that's why the bank rewards us with more interest sensitive bearings so that we keep our money in the bank, less liquid accounts. So, demand deposits are liabilities to the bank because at any time they can be withdrawn by us and therefore they're a risk to the bank. But, initially when that money is deposited, so that thousand dollars, how does the bank break it up? Remember, because if that bank is a member bank of the Federal Reserve, that bank must follow the reserve requirement ratio. So, required, so a portion of that money must immediately go to into required reserves. That means the bank cannot touch that money. It is based on the required reserve ratio set by the Federal Reserve. And if that bank wants to be a member bank of the Fed, then it must follow the required reserve ratio. So since the current required reserve ratio is 10%, let's use 10% for this example. So that means when he deposits $1,000 into the bank, so $1,000 goes to the demand deposits, and $100 must immediately go to required reserves. Where does that other $900 go to? That goes to the bank's excess reserves, and these are the bank's assets, what the bank owns. And excess reserves really just means money the bank can do what it wants with. It can hold on to the money as cash, keep it there as available cash because people are, are always going to come into and out of the bank withdrawing from their demand deposits or they can turn those excess reserves into loanable funds money they can loan so a synonym you're going to see with excess reserves later on in the unit is or actually next unit is loanable funds that money can money the bank can loan So, just to review, that assets must equal liabilities in the bank's balance sheet. The bank's assets, now you're all just blessed, the bank's assets are derived from the liabilities. The demand deposit, and they, they are each other. The demand deposit, that $1,000, becomes the bank's assets. And so now the bank has $100 in required reserves and the extra $900 in excess reserves. So remember, the bank now, why does the bank want you to put your money into the bank? It is not for altruism, it is for profit. Now what the bank can do with these excess reserves is make them loanable funds. They can now turn that 900, now they have $900 available to loan. So excess reserves are one of the same as potential loanable funds. So let's say now someone else comes to the bank, and we're running out of room to another person, but another person comes to the bank, and now they want to take out a loan. This bank now has $900 to loan, and what the bank can do 
It's now turn. We had nine hundred dollars here. It is going to turn nine hundred dollars into a loan. So now excess reserves become let's say zero dollars and now the bank has turned this person's money they have turned 90 percent of that into a loan to another person so now they give this loan to somebody else. Put some fine print on that loan. Now, here is the shady thing. This is the great thing, and also the shady thing about the bank balance sheets, is that the great thing for the economy is that this is the engine for borrowing and investment spending. This is how, this is how uh, this is how all the, the titans of America, like the, the Rockefellers, the Carnegies, the, the Morgans, right? this is how they made the, the Fords, this is how they made their, their fortune from borrowing from gambits on, on goings, from gambits that they needed loans for, and, and going to the bank and securing those, those loans. And John D. Rockefeller becomes John D. Rockefeller when he takes out a $100,000 loan from, from the bank to invest in the emerging oil business in Pennsylvania. So this is the engine for American greatness, the industrial economy, the ability for banks to people to deposit money in banks and for the banks to turn that money into a loan. However, this is also the recipe for uh, a lot of shady disasters and for runs on the historic runs on banks because what happens if this person wants his money back, especially in a time when before the required reserve ratio, and even still as recently as 2008-2009 in the Great Recession, when banks were over loaning and they were giving for the past 10-20 years up until 2007-2008-2009 when they were giving mortgages, loans, toxic mortgages to people who couldn't normally pay them back and the loans eventually became worthless. And so what's dangerous here is that essentially they view, the banks view a loan, which is money they don't have, that's not physically on hand, as an asset because the banks view it as money that is owed to them and therefore coming back to them and therefore an asset, something they own. And, and this as recently as 2007, 2008, caused the collapse of major banks and almost the collapse of the entire banking industry. And certainly a lot of businesses, mortgage businesses, were wiped out and banks were consolidated and had to be saved because of this dangerous habit. So this is the great thing about the banking system, that there is the ability to get loans and, and for people to buy homes and for businesses to do investment spending. But also the incredibly dangerous thing about the banking system is that they, that these loans need to, that they have to, one, like this, this, is, this is dangerous in itself. You can't have zero excess reserves because people are constantly coming in and out of the bank for money. You have to be able to have excess reserves on hands. And we certainly see in the Great Depression when 5,000 banks close, it is because of this. And these loans, if these loans become toxic, which means people are not able to pay them back, then this is essentially a worthless asset of the bank. And unfortunately, uh, as of this video, right, 10 years, 10, 13 years ago, um, many banks went up, went un not up, under because of, because of this. But let's focus on, on the positive and that alt and, and the engine by which the fractional banking system creates a money multiplier and creates loans, which creates more deposits, which creates loans, which creates more deposits, and thus actually increases the, the amount of loans in society, the amount of investment in society, and the money supply. That one deposit 
can have a multiplied effect on the amount of money in the banking system, almost creating money. And when the Federal Reserve does this, when it buys bonds from banks, when it gives banks, when it, when it buys a bond from bank, and it turns that bond into excess reserves, well now it's going through in the millions and millions of dollars. So now let's take a look at the money multiplier.